Papers fly up in the air in every direction as the office workers run for their lives. The PA, brand new at her job, can't figure out where on earth the emergency exit is. She tries every door, but they are either locked or go nowhere. The vast office maze, uncanny in its complexity, stretches along endless hallways and old directories. At the end of the corridor, right in front of her, is a door with a touch bar on it. That will surely be a fire escape, a way for her to get away from the monster. She throws her whole body weight against the bar and tumbles through the door, landing in a janitor's closet. No way out except back. Lying there, sprawled amongst the mops and cleaning products, the PA rolls over and stares back down the corridor. Somehow, she still holds the Starbucks iced latte in her hand. A forked tongue appears around the corner, followed by a flattened nose, long razor-like teeth, and a pair of blank reptile eyes. The hulking anaconda winds its way along the carpets, licking the air, tasting the scent of the PA's perfume. She is powerless lying there crouched in the cramped janitor's closet as the enormous snake slithers towards her. It rears up tall as a human and bears its fangs. The PA closes her eyes and readies herself for the inevitable bite. The knife and fork land on the table with a loud enough clatter to make all the other patrons turn. A large man with a bushy beard spills tomato soup down his chest while a snooty food reviewer chokes on the seafood she's just been trying to swallow. A woman, shaking with rage, screams into her phone. Next time you'll get my order right. It's a caramel oat milk latte with eight ice cubes. No, no, I don't care that one of them melted. It's not good enough. In her venomous tirade, she threatens the job, life, and even the family of whoever she's talking to. The woman slams her phone down on the table loudly enough to make everyone in the restaurant jump again. This time, one of the waitstaff spills an entire tray of drinks over a table of guests. The commotion is loud enough to make the woman's fury shift in their direction. Excuse me, I'm trying to conduct business here. Could you please not be so rude? Stalking into the head office of Louis Vuitton, the woman walks so fast that the brand new assistant following her struggles to catch up. The PA is still signing her contract of employment as they go, doing her best to multitask as she lists off her boss's itinerary. Design meeting from 1 to 1.30, yoga with a personal trainer from 1.30 to 1.45, then into an urgent meeting to get ahead of the latest animal cruelty scandal. The woman struggles to keep track of which issue her colleagues are complaining about this time. It could be the animal testing from the perfume line, the snakeskin rug they've just had to discontinue, or the polar bear scarf they've just announced for the winter collection. She can sense the headache coming on already. The new PA hands her an iced coffee as they get into the elevator. She takes a sip and decides she doesn't even want it, throwing it in the trash as soon as they reach her floor. She's just about to launch into a rant about animal activists and their oversensitivity when the smell hits her. Opening the door to her office, she's punched in the face by the stench of rotting fish. Lying on the floor of her office is a 600-pound tuna fish staring blankly at the ceiling. The woman is so shocked that, for once, she stops yelling and just stares in surprise. In her 35 years in New York, never once has anyone so much as said the word no to her let alone pulled a stunt like this. She turns around to face her personal assistant and asks for her name. It's Melanie. The poor girl is terrified. She asks Melanie why there's a fish in her office, and before the girl can even muster up a reply, the heartless corporate overlord fires her on the spot. She hadn't even signed her contract yet. Once Melanie the PA leaves the room, the woman finds herself alone with the giant tuna, her anger simmering. Looking down at the dead animal, she sees a crumpled mess of cream-colored silicone under it, along with a few wet articles of clothing. Using the tip of her cigarette holder, she pulls at the crumpled silicone to try and extract it from under the fish. Huh? Strange. It looks almost like one of those human masks you buy at a Halloween store, except it's a full suit. In fact, it looks remarkably similar to her head of innovation and product design. Lying on the floor next to it is something small and innocent looking. It's part of a zipper, broken by the looks of it. The black metal is slightly bent out of shape and worn away at the edges. It looks cheap and used, not the kind of material one would expect to see anywhere within a five-mile radius of this office. She picks up the zipper and rolls it between her fingers. Her headache is back. She needs a coffee. Pressing the intercom button, she demands that her new PA immediately go out and get one. 
forgetting that she'd just fired her a few moments earlier. Walking over to the window of her top floor office, she looks down at the crowds of animal rights protesters' stories and stories below, rolling the zipper between her fingers the whole time. Her thumb is itching slightly. Looking down at the metal tab in frustration, the woman sees that the zipper has somehow embedded itself into her skin. Puzzled, she leans in close for a better look, going a little cross-eyed. She couldn't have been squeezing it that hard, could she? Tentatively, the woman tries to pull the zipper out, but it just tugs at her skin, not budging at all. A faint sense of panic starts to well up in her chest. She pulls at it again, trying her best to dislodge it from her flesh, but it won't move. Then a second idea pops into her brain. What if she just… The woman slides the zipper down along the length of her thumb. It glides smoothly, feeling just like the one you'd use to open your raincoat. Except, as it travels along her thumb, the skin itself seems to separate and flop apart, leaving a dark, empty space inside. The layers of her skin peel back as if they're made of rubber, and a flow of steam hisses out from the gap in her thumb. The zipper reaches the palm of her hand, and her thumb dangles there limply, empty, as if nothing had ever been inside of it. Her eyes widen with amazement. She continues to slide the zipper across her palm, up her wrist, and towards her elbow. As it goes, that gentle waft of steam continues to escape from the gap, exposing a row of metal teeth. She can't stop. The zipper glides up her bicep and towards her shoulder. In one final move, she slides it directly across her collarbone and falls to the ground, lifeless. The pile of empty skin sits crumpled on the floor of her office. For several seconds, nothing moves. Then, the middle of the skin shifts slightly, almost as if something inside it had moved. The same happens again and again, just as the woman's newest PA arrives with a nice coffee held proudly in her hands. Why is it so dark in here? What's happened to the lights? She must have had an episode. She doesn't remember falling over, but here she is on the ground in total darkness. The only thing she could recall was hallucinating that zipper. The woman shuffles this way and that, trying to get her bearings. She attempts to put an arm out to lift herself up, but can't. She tries her other arm. Again, nothing. No movement at all. Come to think of it, she can't even feel her arm. Maybe a leg? No luck there either. She must have hit her head pretty hard on the ground when she landed. Perhaps she's got a concussion. The woman does her best to sit up straight and finds that it's actually quite easy. Her back arches and curves effortlessly, twisting at whatever angle she wants. All of that yoga must have been paying off. All of a sudden, she's dimly aware of a light in front of her. What's the old cliché they always say in movies? Don't go towards it? Screw that. The light in front of her is the only thing she can see right now. Without thinking about it, the woman stretches her neck forward and finds that it moves easily and surprisingly far. She must be concussed. It feels like she's almost gliding in any direction she wants. She simply moves her head and she finds her whole body drifting in that direction effortlessly. That spot of light she was looking at? It's not some mystical end of the tunnel situation. It's a gap in whatever material has been covering her. The woman pokes her head out and takes in a breath of fresh air, doing her best to shrug off the rest of the bundle of whatever it was that she'd been buried inside. Was it silicone? She turns her head to look back at it and jumps at the sight. She'd been inside of one of those silicone costumes, the same as the other one under the tuna that had been in her office, except this one. She had seen that face millions of times on magazine covers, plastered across billboards in her selfie camera and in the mirror at home. She's looking at the crumpled husk of herself. A scream fills her head, and she darts her gaze around suddenly to see a PA standing in the doorway, with a nice latte trembling in her hand. Yes, some good news. The woman opens her mouth to talk to the PA, but the words don't come. She tries her best to squeeze her lungs and articulate her vocal cords, but the best she can manage is a soft hissing sound. That's when she spies her reflection in the mirror on the wall and sees the dead reptilian eyes and enormous curved fangs of an anaconda looking back at her. Pandemonium fills the office of Louis Vuitton as the anaconda weaves its way around the corridors, passing the reception desk and through the break room, approaching anyone it finds and asking for help. The snake tries its best to look very calm and innocent, assuring people that it poses no threat to them. However, that's a very difficult thing to do when every time it opens its mouth, all anybody can see is a set of enormous teeth pointing straight at them. 
Within a couple of minutes, everybody seems to have evacuated, leaving the snake on her own, winding her way through the corridors, trying her best not to panic. That's when she spies her PA lying helpless in the janitor's closet. Relief washes over her as she sees that the girl has nowhere to run. This should be easy to talk to her then. The snake rushes over and stands tall, looking down at the girl. She opens her mouth, leans in close, and takes the iced latte from the girl's hand. Placing the cup gently on the carpet, the snake slurps a bit of the coffee through the straw. It's absolutely vile, clashing horribly with the hypersensitive taste receptors on her tongue. She tries to spit it out, but discovers that snakes have very different mouth anatomy than hers, and that motion isn't so easy. Besides, she realizes if she's going to have any hope of convincing this girl of who she really is, taking a drink from that Starbucks cup is probably her best chance to do it. Coiling herself up to look as small as possible, the snake sips away at the coffee and looks at the PA in what she hopes is a reassuring way. Very slowly, she can see the cog starting to turn in the girl's face as she realizes what's happened. Reaching into her handbag, the PA, in shaking hands, pulls out a notebook and a pen and offers them to the snake. It's slow progress and takes a lot of work, but eventually, the snake is able to get enough control over the motor functions of its tail to grip the pen and scribble out a few words, just before the pest control team arrives and tranquilizes her. For three weeks, the anaconda is locked up in the animal control center in New York City. The center wasn't equipped for dealing with giant snakes, so they ended up putting her in the largest dog holding pen they had, which only just about fits her if she coils up in the right way. Three times a day, one of the keepers will toss her slabs of raw meat. She'd always been a fan of a rare steak, little did she know just how enjoyable a raw one could be. Aside from mealtimes, she's miserable. Doing everything she can to communicate to the workers there that she's really a sentient woman, not only a sentient woman but also the head of one of the world's largest high fashion brands, she quickly discovers she's talking to a brick wall, or rather, hissing up one. The more she thinks about it, the more her situation reminds her of some of the photos that had been passed across her desk over the prior few months at various planning meetings. Photos from undercover journalists who had visited her company's factory in the Far East and discovered cages upon cages of live animals locked up, either to be killed for their skin or to be hosed down with chemicals to see if they develop a rash. It was lying there on the floor that she discovered that snakes don't have tear ducts. She would have liked it if they did. Maybe that way, she'd be able to get some of her emotions out. The foundation moved quickly as soon as the news story broke. Agents were in and out of the office within hours. The zipper was placed into a sealed bag and transported directly to Site 64, where it has since remained in a standard issue locker. A series of testing sessions were established to ascertain exactly how SCP-3660 functioned. As soon as the zipper is pressed against the skin of a human being, it embeds itself. Test subjects report no feelings of pain and discomfort, just confusion. That's how the zipper has been able to press itself in so deep. Only a handful of subjects have reported feeling a slight itching sensation and the desire to pull out the tab to relieve that feeling. It sits just below the layer of the skin, in the same way that it would on a jacket or hoodie. If left untouched within 10 minutes, SCP-3660 will activate on its own accord, sliding steadily along the subject's skin and unzipping them. As this happens, the subject is instantaneously, and again without pain, transfigured into an animal. This process occurs internally beneath the layer of skin as it unzips. According to the basic laws of physics, a transformation this drastic and quick would require enormous amounts of energy, and so researchers expected to find heat and pressure levels high enough to instantly boil the blood of the subject. However, the only abnormal thermal readings came from a slight hiss of steam escaping the gap in the skin as it unzips. The new opening of the skin is now lined with a row of metal teeth on either side, as the skin itself appears to be transformed into a slightly different texture and material. Researchers note that the empty skin of the test subject looks and feels somewhat uncanny. Test samples taken into the lab reveal that the complex carbon-based multicellular organ has somehow been transmuted into consistent silicone rubber. Several tests involved placing the D-Class personnel atop a weighing scale, and researchers were shocked to see enormous and rapid fluctuations in weight depending on the animal that the subject was transformed into. Transformed is the correct word to use here. The animal that emerges from the opening in the skin is not an entirely new life form. 
It is difficult to build a method of communication with every creature that emerges from the testing process. Since the animal created seems to be largely random, they can often pose real challenges in terms of setting up a method for feedback on how the test went. For example, three subjects have been transmuted into various species of squid, which had to be quickly rushed to an aquatic test chamber before drying out. Once inside these test chambers, while the squids were evidently very intelligent, they lacked the motor skills and limbs to be able to form any kind of sign language or even point out letters on a board. Great apes, however, have proven much easier to work with as they can quickly adopt sign language and even attempt rudimentary vowel sounds with their throats. What is clear from this testing is that the animal that emerges retains the memories of the person it has replaced. It has the same attachment to loved ones, the same fears, and the same idiosyncrasies. Or at least it does when these things do not come into conflict with the animal's biological nature. One test subject, for example, had always had a strong affection for hamsters. However, when that test subject emerged from the pile of silicone skin as a sparrow hawk, it had a markedly different relationship with them, something that it expressed guilt over for the duration of testing. Try as it might, however, the hawk could not fight its urge to feed on the hamsters whenever it was offered the opportunity. Similar tendencies can be noticed in animals' mating behaviors. A survey of the test subjects revealed that 94.7% of male species reported resisting the urges of feeding and breeding to be the aspect most difficult to control in their new form. From all of the testing conducted thus far, only amniotes, cephalopods, and chondrichthians have been observed emerging from the test subjects' empty skin sacs. Testing is ongoing to determine if there is a set pattern to the animals emerging, although thus far, no pattern has been observed. One particularly memorable test saw a blue whale emerge from the body of one of the D-Class personnel, causing significant damage to the testing facilities as the room had not been constructed with that large of a creature in mind. Since then, testing has been temporarily suspended, as the Foundation discovered that one of the senior researchers was under-reporting the level of testing being conducted and quickly turning Site-64 into the SCP Petting Zoo for highly gifted animals. Fortunately, the head of Louis Vuitton and her PA managed to get in contact with the SCP Foundation. Or rather, the SCP Foundation got in contact with her after she was seen creating a huge social media conspiracy about the fact that her former boss had been transformed into a snake. The anaconda was soon located and transferred to Site-64. Several interview sessions with the snake found an animal humbled by her time in a cage. After a couple of hours of negotiating with the senior researchers, she was able to agree on a deal where she would be used as part of a promotional campaign for charities against the mistreatment of animals. She would attend filming days and perform on camera to show the abuse that animals went through in testing facilities. The general public believes that the footage is computer-generated, and a VFX house has been credited in the adverts. Meanwhile, the Amazon rainforest has one new occupant, a colossal snake that is kind to humans and has a strange addiction to iced coffee. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1550, Dr. Wondertainment's Custom Pets.